Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry to interrupt your conversations. I think uh, we'll go ahead and get started. It's uh, 9.30, and I want to you know, try to keep us on schedule today. But uh, thanks for coming out to this uh, first session on Sunday morning. Uh, my name is David Emery. I work for a, uh, a small consultancy called Conveil that specializes in open source uh, transportation technology applications. And I will be talking this morning about uh, the topic of multimodal routing in the context of uh, Open Street Map, and specifically the Open Trip Planner project, which is a project I've been involved with uh, for several years now, some of you may have heard of. Uh, if you were here, or actually if you were in Portland at the uh, State of the Map uh, US last year, uh, you may have seen a presentation uh, by a, a, a former coworker of mine, uh, David Turner, who's also a longtime contributor. Uh, he gave a kind of an overview of, of Open Trip Planner and how it uses OSM at uh, last year's conference. So what I really want to focus on today is it's like what's happened in the last year since that talk. I'm going to spend a little time at the beginning kind of going over the project for people that aren't familiar with it. But uh, David's slides are online at the OpenStreetMap uh, wiki from last year. And, and that provides kind of a better uh, technical introduction to what, uh, you know, what the project uh, does with OpenStreetMap data and kind of where it stood a year ago. So just to start off with, you know, what is OTP for those that may not know much about it? It's a uh, multimodal trip itinerary planning platform, although we're increasingly using it for not just trip planning, but also kind of network analysis in a more general way, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, written primarily in Java. Uh, it was established uh, in Portland uh, almost three, uh, four years ago now, uh, July 2009. Uh, TriMet, which is the, the main transit agency there, has been one of the, the key champions of this project, and uh, they've helped uh, fund a lot of its uh, a lot of its development over the years. Uh, the other main organization was, uh, that was involved you know, early on was uh, Open Plans, where uh, I used to work. In fact, the new company is kind of a spin-off of Open Plans uh, to focus specifically on this project. And uh, you know, they really were one of the driving forces for the first couple of years. Uh, the project is going through some uh, kind of organizational changes now. Uh, it's, uh, it's moving from kind of a more informal management model to a, a, a more uh, Oh, sorry, let me, uh, is that better? Yeah. All right, sorry about that, thanks. Um, I was just saying that uh, the project is uh, moving to a new organizational model that involves kind of a more traditional uh, steering committee. Uh, for several years, it was a little more informal than that, but I think the project's getting to the point now where uh, you know, there is a, a need for that. It's, uh, it's, it's really grown quite significantly, particularly internationally. Uh, as you can see here, there are uh, now deployments in as of my count this weekend, 14 countries, and there have been translations of the, the main front end into 15 languages. So it's, uh, it's definitely uh, expanded a lot since that kickoff uh, in Portland four years ago. And it is uh, fully open source, licensed under the uh, LGPL. Uh, this is just what a typical deployment looks like, kind of architecturally. I don't want to get too much into the weeds with the, the technical side, but uh, I will point out that uh, there's a series of data inputs that go into what's called an OTP graph, which is an object that encapsulates all of the network information. So you can see OpenStreetMap is, is typically one of the, the main inputs for street network data. You don't have to use OpenStreetMap. It is possible to provide like a shapefile or, or, or another uh, street network data set, but we really encourage people to use OSM because it, uh, it contains a lot of information that a lot of other street data sources uh, probably will not include. Uh, in addition to OSM, there are uh, transit data feeds in many cases. This really was kind of a transit-driven project in its early years. It's beginning to kind of branch out beyond that more and more. But uh, GTFS is the standard originally developed by Google uh, to, uh, to represent a uh, transit network, uh, including route alignment, schedules, that sort of thing. Uh, optionally, you can include elevation data if you want to support uh, elevation-based routing. That's particularly uh, relevant with bicycle routing. And so all that's combined into this object. It's then deployed on a, on a server, typically Tomcat, and that uh, exposes a, a REST API that these various clients can, can be built on top of. There's also the option of, of bringing in real-time feeds that are monitored uh, continuously by the, uh, by the server. That can include uh, the GTFS real-time uh, standard, which is used for service alerts, for vehicle locations, for transit, uh, bike share station feeds, for bike availability. I'll show a demo of that in a bit. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how OpenStreetMap is used, although this is really what David covered in his presentation last year. So again, if you uh, want more information on this, uh, I'd suggest you, uh, you know, take a look at the slides. He spends uh, you know, several slides on each of these items. But just in a nutshell, you know, there's quite a bit of information from OSM that is consumed by OpenTrip Planner. 
uh, first and foremost, just the names and, and geometry of the street, so you have a sense of, uh, of the network itself. Uh, directionality uh, for uh, bicycle and, and auto routing is important, uh, and turn restrictions as well. Uh, Mode-specific permissions, so are you know, pedestrians or bikes allowed on certain streets? And, and you know, there are certain assumptions that are made. You know, motorways, obviously, you're not going to route a, a bicyclist on. Uh, wheelchair accessibility is an important part of the project, and so it consumes that data whenever it's available. Uh, bicycle safety is uh, something we've spent a lot of time on. That was a priority for TriMet in Portland, was providing a, you know, a number of options for cyclists about you know, the type of trip they want and their ways to uh, control the kind of the weighting of different uh, street segments for cyclists in a, in a very fine-grained way. Uh, you can uh, you know, w you know, weight certain types of streets more than others uh, to try to provide the, the best, uh, the best uh, trip for cyclists. And, and there's a fair amount of flexibility that the user has in terms of specifying the type of, uh, the type of bike route they want, and I'll show that in a, in a, in a bit. And then finally, this is something that I think was just being added when David gave his talk last year was area-based routing. Here's an example here in Piazza San Marco. Uh, if you have a, a, you know, a two-dimensional area represented in OSM, um, you know, it will route you through it uh, if, uh, you know, if it's accessible. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we're increasingly using this for, uh, for purposes beyond just point-to-point -point trip planning. Uh, what we call the analyst extension is, is something that I think has uh, generated a lot of interest in the planning community uh, in terms of just doing accessibility analysis. This is an example of of, uh, of Portland uh, showing accessibility in, in Portland for, um, in this case, it's, uh, it's transit. So what you're seeing here is kind of the area that you can reach from, uh, from a given point uh, with certain uh, parameters being set over here. Now, this is using the same underlying engine that was built for point-to-point -point trip planning, but you know, we kind of realized as we were going along that you, know, you can use that for a lot more. You can you know, build these kind of regional accessibility maps uh, using uh, largely the same underlying logic, and so that's uh, something we're experimenting more and more with, and I'll, I'll show you a little more of what we're doing there uh, in, in just a minute. So what's new? This is really what I wanted to focus on uh, since there's been a lot of activity in the, uh, in the last year. Uh, first, we have uh, at least some preliminary work on driving routing, which has been you know, one, of the, one of the features that you know, wasn't really a priority at the beginning because it was being driven largely by, by transit agencies, but uh, certainly any multimodal trip planner needs to account for driving uh, if it's going to be you know, usable on a wider scale. So uh, th there's still some work to be done here, particularly in terms of how, uh, how we calculate speeds. That's kind of the biggest challenge with uh, with driving, and if you were, if anyone was at my talk yesterday, I spoke a little bit to this issue. Uh, what OTP net does by default now is it looks at uh, roadway functional type classification and speed limit data if they're available, and just makes some assumptions about how fast you will typically go on a uh, on a uh, roadway facility. Uh, that's obviously a kind of crude approach. Uh, you, Roadway conditions can, can can deviate significantly from what uh, what you assume based on speed limit or, or functional class. So we're looking at ways to uh, to provide more sophisticated sophisticated information about uh, about speeds. Uh, this is kind of a quick rehash of what I talked about yesterday, which is this project we're working on in the Philippines to use the taxi cab fleet to uh, monitor traffic in real time. Uh, that is then used to assign uh, real-time travel uh, or traffic speeds to OSM segments, and then Open Trip Planner can consume that information in real time and actually use it in its um, in its routing. So this is a pilot project, but we think it's uh, potentially one path forward to do this, hopefully on a larger scale, and to provide more accurate information about uh, about uh, driving based on actual speeds instead of just assumed speeds. Bike share planning is something that uh, you know is big in a lot of the cities where OTP has been deployed. So that's a, a new feature that was added. Uh, what this does is it uh, actually consumes real-time feeds uh, for bicycle availability at these uh, at these systems that have uh, that have uh, APIs, and most of them do. Uh, so you can uh, you plan a trip, and OTP knows to only start your bike trip at a station that has bikes available and only end your, your trip at a station that has docks available. And then it has you know, a walk segment, segment that it plans for the beginning and end of the trip. Been working on the scalability enhancements. Uh, 
you know, OTP originally was developed kind of for the city uh, level. Uh, it's increasingly being used at more regional and even national uh, deployments. Uh, this is one that's being worked on actively right now in uh, the Netherlands. It's a, a you know na a national uh, a national deployment for you know containing all of their uh, transit information, which is both the the Dutch rail system and the, the local transit systems. You know, the whole country is OSM uh, feed, and, and a lot of work's been done just kind of in the routing logic to make these. Uh, these kinds of searches uh, faster, because this was definitely beyond the scale of the project when it was started, but uh, it's increasingly being used for these kinds of deployments. Uh, I talked about the analyst extension earlier. Uh, we're kind of moving in, in you know, additional uh, directions with that. Uh, this is uh, what we call batch analysts, which instead of just you know, doing analysis based on a, a single location, we're actually going through every location, you know, every basically pixel in this uh, graphic and doing a, you know, an OTP regional analysis uh, for that location. What this is showing you specifically is in the New York City area, on a normal day, I think this is at 9 in the morning, this is showing how many people can reach that point. So let's say just choose this point here in lower Manhattan. How many people can reach that point on transit? I believe it's in uh, 60 minutes uh, of travel time. Uh, and you know the the kind of the light blue here is is the lowest, and the yellow is the highest. I, I forget the exact scale here, but I think that's you know millions of people in that case. Uh, so that was done by you know, doing one of those accessibility rasters for each of these pixels, and then uh, calculating the value of, of people that can reach uh, can reach that specific area. Uh, this was actually done in the context of Hurricane Sandy when it hit uh, the New York area last uh, last fall. There was a uh, uh, just a, a group of local uh, kind of transit uh, data enthusiasts that uh, uh, built a, uh, a mock GTFS feed showing all of the um, or showing all of the impacts of uh, Hurricane Sandy, which of course knocked out transit service on almost all the subway lines crossing this river here, uh, knocked out you know a huge number of the, the bus services as well. And this, the same analysis was done with that new GTFS feed, and this is what it looks like. So you can see it. It really knocked out service almost all of lower Manhattan, much of Brooklyn. Upper Manhattan and, and Queens still have some areas, some level of service, but quite a bit less than, than before. So it's uh, an example of the kind of work that can be done with, uh, uh, with you know, OpenTrip Planner being used in this new kind of system analysis capacity. So that's an overview of uh, kind of what's been going on this last year. I want to talk for a few minutes just about uh, what we have uh, planned coming up, then I'll uh, show you a, a demo of the project kind of in its current form. So a few things that uh, I want to focus on, and, and I really want to focus on, on tasks that are kind of OSM uh, oriented. I mean, there are a lot of ideas that are out there for Open Trip Planner, but a few that have been discussed, and some are actually under active development now. Uh, one is to look at uh, the issue of bicycle parking. You know, there is a bicycle parking tag in OSM, so you can have you know, representations of bike racks, lockers, that sort of thing. So you could have uh, the ability to plan a trip but require bike parking at the end of the trip. And so it would be kind of similar to the bike sharing uh, in, a, in a way in that it would require you to end your trip at you know, one of these locations, at least on the bike, the bike segment of the trip, and then it would have you walk from the nearest bike parking to your destination to, uh, to the actual destination. Uh, there could be an option to uh, restrict it by certain types. Maybe you are you know, parking your bike for the day and you want a bike locker specifically, and, and that's, that's uh, represented in the, in the OSM, uh, assuming the data is available. Drive to transit, something that's come up, especially now that we're increasing our focus on driving in general. Again, this is a similar kind of challenge to bicycle parking uh, and, and the bicycle sharing, where you have a kind of a condition on where you can end a segment of your trip. Uh, in this case, it would be parking that is adjacent to uh, transit facilities. And so there, of course, is uh, you know, a mechanism for uh, representing parking in OSM, and so that's what it would consume, and it would see where parking is, is adjacent to transit. Uh, and there might be, you need some way to make it clear that this is parking that is available for transit riders. It's not, you, might, you might have, you know, a parking lot that uh, is for some business that's near, uh, near a transit station, and, and there would need to be a way of making that clear. So there are some challenges to think about here, but I think this is uh, something where there's a lot of opportunity there's even been some discussion uh, of uh, consuming real-time feeds on parking availability. This is kind of similar to the, the bike share issue, where uh, in some cases there are, there are APIs, 
I don't think there's anything really standardized, but there are places that are, are providing real-time information on parking availability at transit stations and transit park and ride lots. And so you could do a, a, an open trip planner instance that uh, allowed you to plan drive to transit trips assuming uh, parking was actually available at the stations. So that's something else we'll be uh, looking at, I think, in the coming year. Uh, we'd like to do more with intersection data. We don't really do a lot with that right now in OTP, but I think we could look at uh, the location of traffic lights, stop signs, other signalization, try to factor that into uh, travel time, especially for, uh, you know, well, actually for all modes, really, bike, walk, uh, driving, it impacts all of them. Uh, and I think kind of in that vein, we've also talked about kind of building a more, uh, more advanced pedestrian safety model, kind of similar to the bike safety model that already exists. Right now, the only thing it really looks at when you do a, a walking trip is, is that segment walkable? But uh, obviously within that category of walkable segments, there's quite a bit of, uh, of, of you know, variability in terms of how walking friendly that really is. And you, maybe you could look at something like at a crossing, how many lanes are you crossing and you know, provide a penalty for, uh, for that sort of, uh, for that sort of uh, experience. And I think you could uh, have something similar to what you have with the bike safety right now. And the final uh, kind of next feature that I want to talk about is, is transit system mapping. Uh, this is uh, a graphic that uh, uh, is from Portland's uh, OTP deployment, but uh, they you know, custom built this tile set uh, and using some GIS tools uh, showing, uh, showing the alignments of, of their um, various transit lines uh, and with these badges showing the route numbers in, in some cases. And I think it would be great to uh, to be able to auto-generate a layer like this that could be uh, overlaid on Open Trip Planner and have that be part of the core Open Trip Planner package. And I think there's some interesting things you could do with, uh, perhaps with uh, OSM relations, if, if you can, if there's some way to take a GTFS file, auto-generate OSM relations for each route, uh, that would get you a lot, of, a, a good part of the way towards being able to create a layer like this that could be then overlaid on top of uh, an OTP uh, map. So that's something I think we want to look at as well in the, in the coming, uh, year or so because there's been a lot of interest in, in better transit system mapping uh, through OTP. So having gone through uh, just kind of where we've been and where we're going, I wanted to show you a little bit about the current, uh, current state of the project. Full screen mode here. So this is a, a deployment here, in, or not here, but in Washington. I wanted to uh, show one that has a couple of things I've talked about, including uh, bike sharing. Uh, this is a new uh, user interface that's uh, kind of still in active development and, and somewhat experimental. Uh, but uh, the main UI that's packaged with OTP was uh, built with uh, open layers in the XT. This one uses um, Leaflet and jQuery UI, so it's uh, in some ways has a little more modern functionality. But both are still supported and both are now packaged in the main OTP repository. So I mean that's one of the advantages to the uh, um, and this REST API approach is that there's no one official client for OTP. I mean, there are a couple that are packaged with the main project, but you know, there are various ones that have been developed outside of the, the core uh, development effort. So uh, that's, you know, that's the idea with uh, providing a, an API that anyone can, can build on. But uh, this um, is showing you um, kind of the central area of Washington. We can, uh, click on a start location, click on an end location, and it will plan uh, a uh, transit trip. In this case, it's a, a bus trip. We can move it around. We can see different itineraries that are proposed for this. Uh, I'll make this a little bit bigger. Uh, it, it gives you the optimal one first, and then it gives you, you know, various other options, and it, it enumerates the, uh, the um, walking segments. You can see the specific segments you walk on. Then you have your various, various information about uh, transit alignment. You can kind of view the whole route, uh, including it highlights the. This is the entire timetable for that segment. And it shows you the part that you're using here. Uh, we can go uh, to the options here and, and change various aspects of the trip. Say we want to only travel on the trains. That now has us on uh, on the the uh, metro rail. Notice that uh, there is a maximum walk in this case because we specified a rail only trip. Uh, and, and with this particular set of start and end points, it's actually not possible to do a rail only trip with only walking 
half a mile, so it, it kind of flags this and says you're actually walking a little bit farther in order to do a rail only trip. Uh, here's a bicycle routing. This is kind of making more intensive use of the underlying, uh, the underlying uh, OSM uh, data. And there's this, uh, this kind of triangle widget here, which uh, allows you to kind of balance these three considerations uh, in your bicycle trip, uh, quick versus flat versus bike friendly. Bike friendly is what uses the safety model I talked about before. Quick is obviously uh, just you know whatever is you know the fastest, so that tends to be a more direct route. When you move it down to to bike friendly, you get a, a, a somewhat more circuitous route, but it's uh, it's uh, in theory a, a more pleasant uh, trip for cyclists. Let's switch over to this uh, analyst module. The way this new UI is developed is that uh, you kind of have multiple views of OTP all in the same interface. So this is uh, this is using uh, the analyst extension to. Uh, show you uh, accessibility from a given point. You can see it's kind of bands of accessibility. This is using transit uh, combined with walking. You can see there's a legend that shows you. So basically each band is about 15 minutes. Uh, you can move it around. You can select a different mode. Say you want to do walk only. This will show you a different kind of, th this will show you a much more uh, concentric type model. You can move this over here and see the impact of the river. Obviously there are only uh, a few places you can cross. If you were at uh, Aaron's presentation yesterday, th this looks somewhat similar to the results he was getting, although it's, it's using a pretty different approach in terms of how it, uh, how it uh, calculates uh, walkability. It's not quite as advanced in terms of looking at, at different, at different uh, types of streets, but it, uh, it's the same kind of general idea. The uh, final thing I wanted to show in this demo is uh, bike share planning. Uh, this is uh, a map of DC with real-time bike uh, station feed information being displayed. You can click on a station, see exactly how many bikes and docks are available at this moment. We can do a start and end, and then it will route you to the nearest uh, nearest station with bikes available. Have you end at the nearest station with docks available? Move that around. So that's um, that's kind of where the the main interface. Uh, stands right now. The last thing I wanted to show you, how am I doing on time? All right, got a couple minutes. The uh, last thing is uh, just to show you the um, kind of s scalability related uh, work that's being done. Uh, this is that uh, deployment in, uh, in uh, Holland that I was uh, talking about. So we can uh, say, um, start just by planning a local trip in Amsterdam. I'm going to turn the walk distance up just so we can. So that works kind of as expected, but say we zoom out, you know, move, start moving these farther apart. It now has us on the national rail. So we need to fix that icon there. Move this over here. And let's try a trip like from one end of the country to the other. So you can see, even as we you know, increase the distance pretty significantly, it's uh, Still pretty responsive. I think this is about the longest trip you can do here, probably. Uh, and this is uh, this is not a local demo. This is uh, over the internet, and actually these servers are over there <laughs> in Europe. So it's uh, pretty good responsiveness. And again, like a year or two ago, this would not have been, you know, possible with Open Trip Planner. They've done a lot of work just on the under underlying logic to uh, to um, really make it more scalable. So. Uh, that's really what I wanted to show today. That's uh, kind of a snapshot of where things are going with the project. There's a, a lot of interest in it right now, a uh, very active uh, community uh, built around it. That's actually the last slide I have is um, uh, just how you can get more involved if you're interested in the project. OpenTripLearn.org uh, redirects to the main GitHub site, which has a pretty detailed wiki, has the repository, uh, pretty active issue tracker. Uh, there are two uh, mailing lists that are fairly active, uh, one for developers, one for users, and then there's a, a chat channel on IRC, on Freenode, that is uh, fairly active as well. Um, and most of us that uh, are active in developing the project are, uh, are there, at least fairly often. And you can always contact me at this email address. So uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for your time. I think we have a few minutes for questions here. Um, I'll just start right here.
yeah. So the question was, uh, is there an ability to uh, uh, consume kind of user-generated information? And one example would be a, a, a transit service alerts. Uh, generally, I think it would have to be kind of funneled through some sort of standard because you know, OTP is, you know, it consumes uh, specific uh, protocols for that kind of information. In the case of service alerts, there's that GTFS real-time feed. Uh, so um, you know, I'd say it probably, at least under the current arrangement, it's going to fall to the agency to have some sort of uh, system of collecting that information, and then they would package it into that uh, into that uh, feed, which OTP would consume. But going forward, it's possible that you know we could look at ways to kind of have a more organic system. And, and actually, with that traffic project, that's actually being cons you know that that uh, that's routing being done based on information that's received from hundreds of vehicles out in the field. So we're kind of beginning to move in that more kind of crowdsourced direction, if you'd call it. Uh, I'll just move my way across here. Yep. Um, we ha we haven't done much with that uh, to date, but uh, I mean, depending on you know, I think a lot of it depends just on how the information is is licensed and how it's available. Uh, you know, if uh, if traffic information were to be available in in some sort of standard format that could be consumed by OTP, then I think it's certainly something that technically could be uh, could be accommodated. It's really just a question of 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 how it's packaged and how it's uh, how it is allowed to be used. Uh, I'll go back here. So, yeah. So the question was, about how do you deal with the transit data from multiple agencies? And you know, that can be a, a, a tricky issue. Uh, right now, if you're if you're consuming multiple GTFS feeds, uh, it you know it uh, assumes a transfer is possible if uh, if uh, two stops are close to each other, and you know, there may be a short walk segment that it, that you know is included in the itinerary. Uh, there is a way in GTFS to kind of have more fine tuning of transfers. Uh, there's a transfers text file that allows you to say this is a preferred transfer, this is not a allowed transfer, and so that will override OTP's default behavior if that is provided. But uh, uh, by default, it just kind of makes assumptions based on proximity mainly. Uh, let's go over here. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that's uh, certainly a, a potential extension of that work. I think with buses, there are some challenges with uh, you know, the fact that they stop quite a bit. Uh, it may not be the most accurate representation of the speed on that uh, on that segment, but it certainly could. Uh, you know, if you were able to filter that out, I think it would uh, it would uh, it would be potentially helpful. Uh, that project I showed is a pilot project using the taxi fleet uh, in Cebu in the Philippines. But I think the hope is to expand it to other types of fleets, and certainly buses, since they already have that information on board, uh, would be a good candidate. So, yeah. So that's that's the project I talked about a little bit yesterday. That's uh, funded by the World Bank, and so they they actually paid for. Uh, it's actually just Android phones that are doing the the data collection on these. Uh, on these uh, taxis, and that's sending all the uh, location information back to a central server that then processes it and, and calculates uh, average speeds on the segments. But the hope is to make that reproducible in other contexts, perhaps using other types of uh, vehicles, because it's all based just on phones. Uh, let's go here. I think we're beginning to see some interest in, in that. I mean, the, the analyst's side is, is relatively new, and uh, it's still kind of maturing. But uh, I think we're seeing some interest from transit agencies that, that see some value in terms of how they could uh, use this to uh, kind of inform the public about potential changes. They can use it in kind of service restructuring uh, operations. We're, be we're beginning to support some of that work. In fact, uh, there's a specific. Uh, Case in actually Auckland, New Zealand, where uh, we're about to work on a project which will use that to uh, 
uh, evaluate a, uh, a, specific, a, a major restructuring of, of their bus system. So I think we're starting to see that, but it's, uh, it's still kind of early in, its, in, its, in, in the process. All right, that's, are we, uh, okay, we're out of time. I'm sorry if I didn't get to all the questions, but uh, I will be around. I'm happy to talk further offline, but uh, thanks everyone. <laughs>